Hey everyone, my guest today is Alex Brightman. Alex is a two-time Tony-nominated actor for his performances in Beetlejuice, The Musical, and School of Rock. Other Broadway credits include Matilda, Big Fish, Glory Days. Most recently, Alex was seen on stage in Luberger's The Wizard of Friendship as Keith's dad. His TV credits include The Blacklist, Law & Order, SVU, Documentary Now, The Good Fight, Blue Bloods, Important Things, and many more. He is the voice of so many of your favorite cartoon characters. And as a writer, Alex has developed stories with NBC, Universal Studios, 20th Century, and Warner Brothers. He's currently developing Cleaners, an animated musical, with the glorious Nick Walker, who's also been on this podcast of the Hamilton best. fame and so many other things. His play, Everything is Fine, was recently developed um, in readings and workshops at Manhattan Theater Club, directed by our mutual friend Cynthia Nixon, and that's expected to have its world premiere very, very soon. I am so unbelievably thrilled to welcome you, Alex Brightman, to the podcast. Hello. Hello. It's been a long time coming. I've, I feel like we've just been passing ships, and so this is like the perfect, perfect thing. Perfect time, perfect moment. I'm so happy. I've done a lot of, especially over COVID, like a lot of different plays and Zoom um, versions of content and and uh, I'll record something and then I'll see in the final cast list, as did Alex Brightman. Um, <laughs> That's right. Some, yeah, yeah, sort right. Of, some sort of Broadway podcast network um, storytelling. Yes, yeah, so we're, um, um, we're colleagues without ever having actually physically met. <laughs> I feel like that might be the best way to go about life. Just colleagues well, yeah. without being in the same space. Actually, that's not true. In this case, I would be um, over the moon to get to do something with you in person. Right back at you. Right back at us. So to that end, I want to just start with, because recently in the Broadway um, landscape, the Tonys are a big deal and they happened just a few days ago. I'm curious, I know you're in Montauk, which is bliss. And, um, <laughs> did you watch them this year? Not only did I watch them, but were you we in had attendance? To... No, I wish. Um, okay. I would love to have seen kind of how they were going to deal with it with their, with the writer's strike and everything. Yeah. And, and so no, we watched it here. Um, and we didn't take our eyes off of it. Even when we took our dog on a walk, I watched it on my phone. Um, and I, it's always so cool to see friends doing the thing that they do, they do best and, and watching people get uh, acclaim for what they've done and awards and get the chance to speak on things. Um, I thought it went really well considering, you know, the yeah. limitations that, that they had. And I thought Ariana did like an incredible job at sort of navigating, uh, via improv basically yeah um, and as an improv per as an improv person i i was stunned at how you know yeah. well and composed that was in front of millions of people um that being said yes. i do think there is merit to having uh written you know content uh if it's going to be you know what it is um but i was i was relieved to see that it went off without many hitches and um very proud of the winner's circle. I thought that yeah. there was some some beautiful speeches and some beautiful moments. And uh, I love the Tony Awards. I always have. So I have a very big fondness for it and, and being much closer to it now, you know, yeah. having been nominated, it's just very special. Did you grow up watching them? Oh, yeah. I, okay. So can we talk about that? Like your origin story in terms of falling in love with the theater and all of that? Can you just sort of jump into whatever feels good about that story? Sure. I think I, I feel like I've been a performer for so long. Like I've, I've said this before, but it's worth repeating that I basically you would, I did the cliche, you know, kid performer thing, which is like perform on your fireplace mantle, uh, put, you know, crank the music up in your house. And I would pretend to be, you know, Gloria Stefan and Billy Ocean and Steven Tyler. And um, my parents raised me really right with music. Um, and so I, grew up singing all the time and didn't know that theater was a profession. So just figured it was one of those extracurriculars you did for life. On and a mantle. You just thought it was a place that you stood on. I'm picturing I, I, tiny well, Alex on a mantle. <laughs> you know, you don't have to picture it. There is footage. There is, there is, it doesn't exist online, but there is, I know right. for a fact that there is, there is a, uh, you know, super eight footage of it somewhere. I'm sure. Um, Where was but, home? Uh, Sa Saratoga, California. So the Bay Area, San Jose-ish, you know, 45 minutes south of San Francisco, 30 minutes um, east of Santa Cruz. Okay. Uh, nice place to grow up. 
very cool. Um, very nice weather. You know, you don't get really any seasons. You just get one kind of nice. Um, and I had relatives in New York City. So we would ve- we'd visit my grandparents in New Jersey and they would take us to the city. So I, I grew up knowing about New York City and knowing it and liking it and didn't know anything about theater on a professional level until I was taken to see Cats on Broadway and fell madly in love with just theater in general. Just sort of, I think my first love of theater was the theater experience and not a specific show. I just really enjoyed every time I stepped into a theater beyond Cats uh, in, and including Cats, every single time I still step into a theater, I feel this like immense love for the darkness, the collective sort of unity that an audience creates and uh, just that it feels like some secret club for however long you're in there. And then you go back to your life, but it feels like this really great uh, relieving vacation from life. And then I, I fell in love it. with I'm, character, you know. I love it. I'm picturing like a speakeasy in my mind, like right. this idea that there's like a secret password and you're like, you get inside. It's like the password is hooch and you get in. <laughs> exactly. And- <laughs> right. And yeah, but that's what it feels like. It does feel like there's only a specific amount of people that are allowed in the theater that that day. And then you close the doors and it's not a walkthrough. You get a seating and you get these singular people that walk in with all their different lives at stake and all that kind of thing. And then within minutes, they congeal into what is one thing, an audience. And there's a collective like response and there's this hive mind that happens. And so all of that as like an eight-year-old. I couldn't put it into words until I was an adult, but I just felt so colored in like, oh my God, this is like, I want to be up there. I want to be out here. I want to be wherever, you know, and I never wanted to leave. I still don't. I mean, I love theater. I've done everything. Theater is the thing that has its hooks in me, I think for life. So I think it started very young when I was still very spongy. When did you kind of, so obviously it's one thing to perform in your living room, singing (laughs) songs you love so much for people who adore the experience of listening to you sing. But when did you realize, like, actually I sing, you know, I feel like a lot of people talk about like mimicking the the, the style and the sounds of people they love to listen to when they're young, right? Like when you just described the, the kind of people you, you were channeling as a young person um when did you understand like a uh, not everyone can do that not everyone can pick a singer whether it's Gloria Estefan or Frank Ocean and sound like them or do a pretty damn good job um and understand like what your voice could do I think that I again going back to my parents raising me on the right music I am a direct result of I think every artist is like, you know, a direct result of some kind of mimicry and because I, it just is inevitable. So I right. think I'm a direct result of the music that I listened to, you know, hollow notes and Aerosmith and some rap and R and B and gospel. So I, I, I don't, I, I think there was a moment truly where I started to understand, like, I think I have a pretty good voice. I think I'm flamboyant enough to make this happen in front of people with abandon and then once I started doing theater, which was not long after I saw my first show, nine, 10, around there, uh, even auditioning, which we did in front of people in the Bay Area, we auditioned in groups. And so, which is just so not how it is, <laughs> um, but prepared me, you know, to be fearless. I started to see pretty quickly that not only I think was I very good at it, but I think I was also one of the only people in my group that took it extremely seriously, even right. at a young age. Like I right. I knew pretty early on, this was going to be part of this life thing of mine. Right. And so you had like a deep respect for it. Deep respect for it. And I, again, I blame my parents. They raised me on the right kind of comedy. I mean, I, the 2000 year old man and, and all the Mel Brooks, Carl Reiner stuff, and maybe seeing a couple of things I shouldn't have seen mm-hmm. <laughs> as a child, but it really kind of is who I am. Um, so yeah, I, I have a deep respect for what came before. And I think I had it even at a young age. I think I really respected the craft of it all. So in terms of taking something that you just love to do um, and and becoming a professional at it, did you um, did a job bring you to New York or did you come to New York, you know, in the movie version, you know, with Disney music playing in a suitcase and a dream? Like, how did yeah. that happen? My overalls and a piece of wheat sticking out of my teeth. 
Um, I just saw yeah. Shucked actually. Yes, yeah. Oh exactly. my God. I loved it. That's like that. I mean, that show speaks to every bit of who I am comedically. All right. Um, well, that is great. I know Robert uh, Horn. I, oh. I could see that. I mean, that comedic voice and, and that really <laughs> unbelievably fast brain. He is um, a bucket list, bucket list yeah. book writer that I'd love to work with. Yeah. Truly. yeah, and, yeah. We, and, we, and we've met and have very similar kind of sensibilities. Um, I can see that. Yeah. But I, what brought me to New York was school. I wanted to, I had heard NYU, NYU, NYU. You got to go to the musical theater program at NYU. So I didn't do any more research. I just said, okay, that's where I want to go. And the boring story is I had good enough grades to go and the audition went well. And I think that maybe put me over the top. So school, um, NYU brought me there uh, for just a couple of years. I didn't finish, but I uh, sort of left to sort of try and do it. Um, Did you, do you remember what you sang uh, to get into school? I do. I sang Santa Fe from Newsies and I sang, no one has ever asked me this question. I am so thrilled that you asked this question. <laughs> well, and then I'm going to ask you to sing it, but that's a whole other thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. Let me, yeah. It's, I, I sing every day here in Montauk. Um, of course you do before noon. <laughs> that's right. Um, so Santa Fe. And then I sang the streets of Dublin from a man of no importance. Um, it was kind of the big hot, you know, tenor song, um, Stephen Pasquale you know, everything I wanted to be uh, right. kind of thing. So I sang those two things in, in a room that felt like, you know, just like an office. I mean, it was just so not fancy and so not the dream. I, you know, you think you see these movies where you're on stage at Juilliard and it's like the 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 three adjudicators in the audience and it's a high stakes thing. This might as might have been a janitor I was singing for. I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but they just seemed to kind of nod, nod along and then kind of ask me what studio I thought I'd be right for. Cause they, they give you kind of a chance to pitch yourself. Yeah. What did and you I, reply to that? Well, I wanted to be in the musical theater program just because it's what I knew best and, and what I was succeeding at in middle school and high school and, and thought that that's going to be a big part of my life. But I also deeply wanted to be an actor in musical theater. I didn't, I didn't have the dance, you know, sort of interest and I didn't want to do things that were quote unquote classical. Like I'm not built for things like carousel and I, as much as I love them. Um, so I wanted to be in the Atlantic theater company, the um, David Bamett program, and then also playwrights horizons. I wanted to be sort of an acting based program, but I was placed in the musical theater program, cap 21 at NYU, the Tisch school. Right. Right. And so when you say, you know, Donna Murphy was on the show and she was telling me how, I mean, she went before you obviously, but that <laughs> they really discourage auditioning while you're in school and she did it anyway and ended up, you know, understudying and they're playing our song or something like that. And the rest is history. Um, did you sort of do it under the radar or did you actually leave and go, you know what, I, I want to actually be doing it and I don't want to have to wait. Kind of both. Um, I didn't have the greatest experience at NYU. It was going through a weird kind of transition and uh, the end of it being that cap 21 is no longer part of NYU anymore. They're part of Malloy college and thriving, which is great, but they just had a couple of troublesome kind of years. And so I was just very unsatisfied and unhappy about what I was learning. If anything, I just felt very like it felt very, I don't know, like I could have done this myself. Um, and a lot of us felt that way. So I felt really validated. And so I ended up auditioning, I guess, under the radar. I mean, I guess I didn't I'd make a big uh, you know, deal about it. I didn't tell people I was doing it, but I did, certainly wasn't doing it in like disguise and secret, um, which would maybe would have been great. Uh, I'd like to then, see that. Yeah, right. Whatever like the a disguise little, would be. Like the sort of Groucho Marx and a nose, must, old exactly. classic disguise. And then, but then if I didn't do a good audition as the disguise one, I could just take the disguise off and re-audition. Exactly, um, exactly. Learn from my mistakes. Exactly. But then after year two, I just sort of had had it. And I um, tried to audition for the Playwrights Horizons musical practicum, which was just starting out. I thought that would be really cool because that was yeah. going to be an acting-based musical theater program. So right. I auditioned. I ended up getting admitted. So I left Cap 21 to go and do that. But before I had really the chance to get invested, I had auditioned for enough things and I booked something. So I booked uh, the History Boys um, with the National Theater that was traveling to the Amundsen in LA to be the first sort of uh, production right after the Broadway one. So I ended up being in that. That's incredible. It was amazing and the best learning experience I could have ever started with because it just taught me how to be a professional on top right. of how to do a three-hour unabridged British play. Yes, that um, wasn't a musical. 
wasn't a musical. And that's sort of like the way, if you would have given me the choice, I would have just continued doing plays because I just enjoyed the process. I enjoyed working with, I mean, I love working with the Brits because their whole thing is process. And I am now well known for like throwing as much spaghetti in a rehearsal room as possible. Or as Carrie Butler put it, she was terrified for the first couple of days working with me because it's like, she said it was like working with a tornado. Um, And so- Can you you kind of (laughs) um, uh, talk a little bit more about what that means? I come from, I come from an improv kind of core. Um, even before I started doing improv, I just really enjoyed riffing and and seeing what's there and discovering things and and really just throwing spaghetti against the wall. Even in right. community theater, right? So um, being fearless and being willing to make mistakes, but just trying a ton of stuff. I, I would say that like a great title for a possible memoir in the future would be mostly mistakes. Um, <laughs> is that like? But that I think can we mostly, do a podcast together called Mostly Mistakes? <laughs> it would be a great one. Just that would be really about, fun. Yes. Yeah, to talk about everyone's kind of foibles that like let them trip into an amazing career. Yes. Um, and I just yeah, I learned how to be fearless through community theater and through the idea that there aren't really terribly wrong choices you can make in theater as long as you're willing to justify them. And that theater is not about you. Theater is about the whole. Theater is about the piece. And so I've gotten really lucky to help develop things, which is what, you know, the Carrie Butler thing anecdote was about is that I walk into a room and I just don't, with respect, obviously to the writing and everything, I don't give myself a lot of limits. And so- Where does that, you talked about like, I mean, honestly, the number of times it's gone both ways. People who, in spite of their familial situation, were able to pursue this with confidence. Mm. And people who, from day one, had parents who just saw them, like A, were just great people, and B, saw their kid and were really excited about who their kid was and gave them wings, right? And some of us had financial constraints to deal with. Some of us didn't. There are a million reasons that some of us have the privilege to pursue this and some of us don't, right? But I feel like you're describing um, a household I wish I grew up in. It sounds fantastic. The Bright is Brightman your actual last name? Is that her? Yeah. Is that okay? I love the Brightmans. That's what I, I love, want to yeah. say. We well, we, I'm, I'm on the same page as you. I love the Brightmans we as well. Stand them 100. Big time. Um, it takes confidence early on. It's one thing when you're number one on the call sheet and sort of built a career. You know, when you're Beetlejuice and Beetlejuice, right? <laughs> when you're Rock in School of Rock. I mean, yeah, right. you obviously have had. Yes. Um, you know, your career led to certainly on the Broadway stages, um, you are the star of the show. And Mm. that work has been incredibly um, lauded and rewarded by people in the community who vote for their favorites in in the community. Um, Where does that willingness to um, A, try anything, possibly make a fool of yourself, B, not even know the director yet, but go like, you hired me, so this is kind of like, this is my process. I feel like you knew your process so early on when the rest of us were like, I don't want to make noise and I don't want to stand out, you know, (laughs) so so where does that, because you are not known for having a big ego, you are known for being like game, like those are very different things, right? So you just talk about like, how were you a star before you were a star? What is that? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you. What a You're nice, welcome. really nice setup for a question. Um, I, I, well, one, let me just answer the first part, which was that I would love to say that I, you know, have that story of like, I grew up and I, nobody helped me and, you know, and I just did it all myself. They're just completely untrue. I, I had incredibly supportive parents who saw what was going on early. And, you know, my mom, was big rock and roll chick. My dad uh, founded the disability solutions group at Apple computer. So like incredibly compassionate people and ambitious people. And I think when they saw this ambition, they never, ever, ever questioned it. So I, and also I was privileged. I was, you know, probably upper middle class, if not upper class, you know, where I lived. And so I think, you know, knowing that it could have been pretty easy to like rest on that and know like, I'll be fine. But I don't know if that's in my brain. I don't just, maybe that's just, you know, wonderful ignorance, you know, to not know that you grew up in a certain way. Uh, but I look at all of this, like there is 
no tomorrow with it, with the career. I always kind of felt that way um, about, I kind of knew the odds early. I think that I knew how many people audition for a single thing and why it's crazy that anybody would get anything. So that would only inspire me to like, well, I'm going to try my best. So if I don't get it, it won't be for lack of preparation. So I think I understood that early. Um, and then that's just been with me the whole time. And I think it it's less about talent. Like I don't work. I do. I mean, I take voice lessons and things like that. I work on what I have and I stretch out my comedy skills and I always am watching and and, and looking at stuff. And but I think the perf- I took myself incredibly, what I did incredibly seriously early on. Um, and I don't know whether I thought that that would help me in the future or just because it felt good to just know your shit. Um, things just went well when I knew better thing. And I just, you know, kept, kept right. kind of working on that. Yeah. Right. Um, did you ever do, were you ever part of an improv, an actual improv group? Or did you just instinctually understand the yes and of it all? Uh, I think that I was in an improv group before I was in an improv group. You know, I was sort of the yes and came naturally and easy. And I think there is ego and narcissism to all of that. You know, you want to be in the center. And so the more you talk, the more you're in the center, uh, which yeah. I've now figured out the balance. <laughs> yes, yes, um, yes, I think, yes. I hope. Um, and yes, then I was in an improv group in high school. Um, and then I've done improv sort of throughout. I wasn't in a a bona fide sort of collective in New York by like in any sort of UCB kind of form, but I've done so much improv over the years and did it in California and New York that I'm an improviser sort of without a home, I guess. But, um, I sort of, I've been accepted by the sort of the powers that be improv wise, you know, having done documentary now with Mulaney and, and all those guys and, uh, so yeah, I think I feel accepted. I just, I don't have like a group to lean on improv wise. Right. So when did you go from being a member of an ensemble um, to, well, let me go this way. History Boys was a national tour. What was your first Broadway show? And as a kid who walked into the theater, saw Cats among other things and had that these are, this is hallowed ground, like the respect and awe for the thing. When did you walk into a Broadway theater through the stage door to your dressing room for the first time? And can you take us back to that moment and feeling? Well, I don't know if you know this, but the first Broadway show that I did was called Glory Days, and it only ran for one night. So uh, the rehearsal process was in a studio and I walked through the stage. How really happen? How does <laughs> it, that one night thing, like I heard like that sign is on the wall in Joe Allen's because it was a bomb, but like. We're but, on there. Okay. How, like that seems implausible to me. So yeah, right? how does that actually, like there's no review yet. Like, like just explain how that happens. I think, and I'm not an expert. So I want to want to preface that by saying, I maybe I'm talking out of my ass here, but I believe it has everything to do with money. It has everything to do with advanced sale and, and, and what it looks, you know, projected sort of what things look like in the future. And so I think that it just is that. And I think it, has to do with like the steeliness and and uh, stubbornness of a producer to keep something running uh, despite, you know, all the writing on the wall. So I think that these producers pulled out when they saw the know, show. <laughs> well, but, uh, no, no, no. I think, <laughs> no, because the show was a hit out of town. And that was the thing. It was like, it came into town with no notice. So there was no buzz. There was no, people would walk past the theater and go, I don't know what this is. They're not seeing it. You know, we couldn't. Okay, wait, did you do Glory Days out of town or did you no. do it? Okay, so the show Glory Days that's been out of town, yes, a musical. Huge hit, yep. Okay, comes to New York, you rehearse it, some of the original members are in it, and some new all cast members yeah, come all, in. Yeah, all of the originals and then two understudies, so I was one of two swings in the show, and that was the okay. company. Okay, so you rehearse for the whatever amount of time you rehearse, you move into, do you remember which theater you were in? Yeah, it was the Circle in the Square. Okay, so you move into Circle in the Square, you walk in as a professional actor on yep. Broadway, Yes, and you do one show. We did about maybe two weeks, two and a half weeks of previews. Okay. Um, so we had audiences, we had papered crowds, mostly papered, now that I right. know, you know. Right. Uh, and then, yeah, opening night. And that was our, you know, opening night is when you kind of start counting. So that's your number one performance. Okay. And so we are on the record having one single performance. So you get, do you even go in 
to work the next day and the and the stage manager says hey we're having a meeting in the house can everyone come in or do you, are you told <laughs> we'll send you your stuff like what <laughs> Sort of both. It was, I had the next day was our day off, ironically. And so I was kind of near the theater. I was having lunch with a friend in Midtown and I got a call from the company manager saying we were having a cast meeting and I'm 20. I'm not, no, I'm not even 20. I'm 19 years old. So I'm like, yeah, that's what happens. We have cast meetings. Yeah. <laughs> so I figured it was just part of the gig. And I was like, sure, we, we have, have opening a, night and then a meeting. Yeah. Like an immediate emergency meeting that was not supposed to be called. And now of course that happens. And so we went to the theater. I was a block away. I was at uh, Worldwide Plaza and I walked in and there was a couple of, uh, was maybe two veterans of the company and like the stage manager who kind of had this look on their face that I read pretty well. Producers came in, told us we were closing. We asked when, they said last night. And they said, you have X amount of time. We are, you know, it was, it was dealt with responsibly, but it was very quick. And for me, because I was 19 years old. I didn't I didn't think I'd be in anything of substance until I was 35. I mean, I just right. didn't think it. I who does? I don't I'm not that crazy. You know, I, I I have ambition and I have dreams and aspirations and I have confidence, but in no way as a 19 year old am I like, this makes sense to be on Broadway. Totally. So when we closed, I was sad. I mourned the show, obviously. You want a job and I wanted to keep having fun, but for me, there was this great fantasy camp kind of aspect to it, like two weeks on Broadway. <laughs> and then that's what a taste of it is. So the taste yeah. was wonderful. Yeah. I wanted more for sure. But now I have this superpower, which is like any show that lasts beyond opening night, I consider a win. So it's like wonderful. And also the friends I made on that show are I've I've kept I mean, we are we're friends today. So it's nice to sort of have started with a group of guys that have this story and have this yeah. bond uh of real a very real realistic look at what it is to do this as a profession because it can go away literally in one day that is unbelievable um you know you hear tell of these stories <laughs> yep. um I want to ask about you know just because I could literally go through every single one of your credits because I know you're such a fabulous storyteller that you'd have some incredible anecdote I'll so, go quick I'll go quick I'll, I'll exactly. shorten up my answers I'll go quick Exactly. But also I feel like there is, um, what did we call it? My mistakes, many mistakes, all mostly, mistakes. I would say mostly, mostly. mistakes. Yeah, mostly, and mostly mistakes. mistakes. We will, we will get to have like a deep dive into all totally. of that. Um, I would say that where I really became aware of you, um, is probably more as, as, you know, school of rock happened. Yeah. Um, where, you know, you weren't replacing someone in a big splashy show, you were originating, you know, the lead in a Broadway musical yeah. um, that was an adaptation of like a really beloved movie, um, you know, and and we kind of see Jack Black in our minds before the Broadway musical comes up. Yep. So how did you kind of, I'm sure you were aware of the film uh, and, and oh, yeah. I, I'm sure like so many of us, whether it's Tenacious D or Black, Jack Black as a as the movie star, yeah. um, you know, we're aware of him and and sort of what his what he does. So how did you handle sort of taking on because it's heady, you want to make it your own, but you can't deny there's this there's this thing that came before you. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process of School of Rock, which you were brilliant in, by the way? <laughs> Thank um, you. So so was that fun? It was. I. This goes along with like the ignorance of just putting your head down and trying to make something good. So I never thought about it actually it, until it was far too late, which is good that like yes. people were coming to see something that was beloved and uh, needed to have some care. And might um, have an opinion about it. Like, well, that is or isn't like what I expected. Well, they definitely did. So, <laughs> so there was plenty of that. But no, I mean, I think this monolith that is Jack Black in general, but also like what he created with School of Rock really cemented this thing for him. Uh, huge shoes to fill. Uh, but I'm not a great impressionist. And so I think that's helpful to not be like, I do a really good Jack Black. Um, but I also just enjoy reading scripts. And so the script told me that this was a guy that was a burnout who hates kids. And I was like, I can work with that. You know, I so I just kind of, that was what kind of kept me driving was this like, me in a situation, not me trying to do Jack Black. Who am I as a teacher who's hungover, 
who has no ambition except to be a rock star beyond belief, right? Saddle with these kids, what would I do? And I think like it makes it easy, but it also is hard to be vulnerable on stage like that. And and I never thought about it. Honestly, I never thought about sort of what came shoes. before. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that was extremely helpful because I think if I did, I was already nervous enough and had plenty of imposter syndrome just because I came school of rock was my fifth Broadway show or something like that. And it was one of those like up and coming, you know, brand new actor, Alex, Bre- you know, it's like they break you overnight. So there was like a ton of pressure of that already. So I think that that was the thing, the imposter syndrome, just to get over the idea that I'm even leading anything. Um, after being in the ensemble of many shows. And so I, I mean, just, to, I thought to, of that. To someone listening who who isn't a performer and, you know, people all over the world listen to this and so they don't always understand like what the steps are exactly. Right. They might hear five Broadway shows and go, wait, that's that's a tremendous amount of Broadway right. shows to have. So what do you mean by that? When Can you just explain, but you were not leading those shows, you were... In the show, yeah, part of I mean, part of the you know, you flip the page and you see all the wonderful people as uh, headshots in a show, and you recognize them on stage. Maybe one of them pulls your eye, yeah. um, and just it, there was a comfort, and also again a privileged comfort of being in that many Broadway shows to get comfortable, without having any sort of real true spotlight being thrown on me to have to like shoulder anything. Right. So it's, fu- it's always fun to be in an ensemble. It's fun. It's comforting. You have support, and then when you're the lead of something. This is where it gets scary because you are the only person out there. And sometimes, literally, you're the only person on stage in front of 2,000 people. And Mm -hmm. there's something, if you thought about that, you'd lose your mind, which is why it's helpful as actors to just play the moment. But that's what I mean is like there was five Broadway or four Broadway shows that came before me where I was just part of a group and part of the ensemble and part of the thing and got to watch a bunch of people lead shows going, wow, that's unbelievable. How do they do that? And then go home and go to sleep and wake up in the morning and do it again. Yeah. Trial by fire, for sure. Yeah. Had to really, and I mean this, when I say imposter syndrome, that still kind of happens, I think, to a lot of people, but it really felt like for a long time, they were doing me a favor by putting me in this show. And I felt that. And there's an anxiety that comes with that to deliver. Uh, but then you remember, and this goes along with the thing about like what theater is, is that you're doing them a favor. They cast, they want you. They didn't have to cast me. There's no, no one was doing anyone favors. No one knew my grandmother and was like, you know, oh, do it for her, you know, whatever. (laughs) Um, It's, it's Granny Brightman. Granny Brightman. Granny Brightman. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And so there's at some point, whether your friends remind you or you remind you, you earned it. And so you go and you be a leader. You took, I took everything that I learned from people that led shows, good and bad, because I watched people fail at leading as well, whether it was the lead or somebody else. And you go, okay, I'll never do that. If I ever lead a show, I'll never do that. I'll definitely do this. And so kind of culling together all what made what I believe was a leading man um, tried to imbue it. And it went well the first time. I mean, I think that I led the company incredibly well. I think I did the show good, you know, did the show well, but I'm very proud of the way I've led Beetlejuice and School of Rock as sort of a company man, as sort of like keeping the building afloat and happy and buoyant um, and leading by that, example yeah and I do yeah. believe that inspiration and I think leadership comes from all angles in theater where I think that's very different than a lot of other creative mediums I think you know film is a you know it trickles far down from the top and you don't find like inspiration or leadership from like a PA right like in theater there's leadership from the assistant to the assistant stage manager I mean there's leadership everywhere in that room So I knew that people could take the mantle, but like, I really wanted to be a great leader and have it trickle from all ends of me to know that I'm here for you. I have to lead the show at some point, you know, I've got to be on stage without you, but when I'm back, I have you, please come talk to me. I want to be a source of comfort in a building because I think it shows on stage. I think Mm -hmm. chemistry is not just about the thing you have with each other. Chemistry is like a very felt, group think kind of happiness or unhappiness depending on the temperature of the building but right i think it affects a show one for one yeah 
Well, I mean, especially School of Rock. I mean, that's a lot of kids. In Beetlejuice, it's mostly <laughs> your your peers and some unbelievably equally seasoned performers and some new ones and younger ones as well. Yeah. But but kids. School of Rock, of you, you're Maria von Trapp, right? Like you I have was. this. Yes. <laughs> I was Marty, Marty von Trapp. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but they were, you know, I got to be honest, they just yes. re- to say a thing about the kids that they were yeah. right on board when I decided to start using improv in that show and kind of taught them by, you know, osmosis. They were just as helpful for me once they started, once the, the, I sort of was able to unlock their fearlessness. They understood what you were doing and went with you. And oh, did yeah. that happen nightly in the show um, in yeah. a way that were you ever like, what is the stage manager doing when Alex Brighton is in your show? <laughs> And the show, the director maybe comes back once in a while to say hello, but yeah. once it's yours and, and all bets are off, how yeah. do you negotiate and navigate the state manager's job? Cause they sure. have some job to do as well. Mm-hmm. Um, they are, they are by proxy now the director of the show. I can yes. only imagine what the notes look like each night that get dispersed to all of the powers that be when Alex is in your show. How yeah. does that get navigated? What's the understanding? I think that's what it is. I think that you earn it. You earn an understanding. You don't just do your thing and have people try to catch up with you. I think that it happens in the first rehearsal. You earn the respect and understanding that I may go off the rails, but I'm not going to tank the show. So I think that there is a mutual understanding that I will make sure the cues are called. I won't. I will make sure that this roadmap is clear, but we may take a little detour here and there. Um, and, you know, the improv in School of Rock was minimal to medium, or as like Beetlejuice, it was like, <laughs> there could be a very different show every night. But I think it right. was this respect of like, we need to hit things, set pieces need yes. to move on, the show needs to be a certain amount of time. So right. it wasn't just, you know, this playground for me to like start doing my, you know, stand up act with. Yes. You know? Well, Beetlejuice in that way, was it written, was that, was that script crafted with you in mind? Do you think eventually, I mean, right pretty quickly, I think they did one reading before I joined yeah, and then I took it from there and was the guy until we closed. So again, when it comes to like mutual respect, the script was already incredible. When I first had my hands on it, the script was unbelievably funny, laugh out loud, catch you off guard, kind of funny, which is rare, I think on a Broadway, big commercial thing. Usually as the audience, you're ahead of things. I was already so enamored with the script that when we started playing around, slowly you know it's not you don't just again you don't come in guns blazing going i know better than you and so once the respect was earned and the understanding was there then i think the new pages that would come in just happened to roll off my tongue a little better that every day went because they we they understood you how i would them. deliver it. <laughs> well we well we i would say yes, a big collective I, collectively yeah. there was a lot of stuff in the room that made it to the show in the script and that's fine like nobody's fighting for any sort of like credit or like you're not asking for royalties no although that's another conversation yeah if they want to listen if they want to give them to me i'm not going to fight it but i didn't certainly was there for the show this goes along with like you never do theater alone you're doing theater not just with your cast either you do theater with the whole thing and so yes i would say that they eventually started writing things that would sound better if i said them yeah yeah Um, but also we all figured out how to give Beetlejuice the latitude to do things while also maintaining the storyline because he's essentially the narrator. That's right. And it's crafted. I mean, I mean, in a way it's, you know, it's your cabaret and you can, you know, call and then people join you on stage and then they're off stage. I mean, um, I want, you may hear my dog making strange sounds in the background. So I don't know if you hear that, but. Well, just to give you a sense, I'm sitting, laying next to mine. Okay, good. Good. Well, mine is awake. So that okay. is the difference right now. Okay. Um, a couple of things about Beetlejuice that sure. that make it sort of historical Broadway, right? It, it, it's it's got it's going to have stories about it. It's going to be written about. It's going to be a part of um, whatever chapters are being written on completely nonlinear journeys for a yeah. Broadway show. Sure. So a couple of things that come to my mind when I think about Beetlejuice and just stream of consciousness. One, um, closed open, closed open, you know, it had a, an unbelievable journey in that way. Yeah. Two, the voice that you found and used and maintained during that show for that character, 
Sure. And three, I remember that you got a concussion and that was news. <laughs> um, just A, it was theater news and B, I'm a human and you're a human. And even though I hadn't met you in person, I care deeply about you and I'm in awe of your work. That's and that's really, nice. right? So so it, I clocked it, not just like, oh, that's page six, but like this, um, right. this happened to a human that people I love, love deeply. Oh, so wow. um, can you sort of talk, I mean, Jenny Gersten was on the podcast and we talked about again, in terms of having another show, the journey of that show from a producerial standpoint yeah, um, right. is a whole other um, fascinating. Oh my God. Yeah. That's narrative. Story is incredible. Yeah. So just, you know, in our, in our time that we have together now, and then I want to talk about the, you as a writer as well. Sure. Um, Let's talk about, and maybe I'll ask you to do it unless you can't do it easily for people who didn't see the show, what I mean by the voice oh, yeah. you use in Beetlejuice, because I feel like you know how to manipulate it and take care of yourself beautifully. Yes. Um, and yeah, so can you do the voice so people know what I'm talking about? Sure. This is the voice that I did in the show. And it's something that I crafted over like a year uh, to really get right and to do consistently. Um, it always sounds better if I do it a couple days in a row, but this is sort of the main thing, which is the vibration of the cartilage that's in my throat that I'm sending my vocal cord sound through. So this sound that I use to speak normally and healthily is still coming through, um, but I learned how to vibrate certain cartilage in here, <clears throat> same cartilage you use to clear your throat, or at least to clear mine. And just to able to sort of singularly vibrate it on top of my vocal cords so that when it's vibrating, all I have to do is keep talking and vibrate it on top of it. And so I going in and out of it is more of the how you kind of explain what's going on. And I, as I started to put it with when I taught classes and Q&As, it's sort of like an Instagram filter over my voice. <laughs> that's what it feels like. And uh, it's now become like a party trick that's completely useless except for voiceover. But uh it really did help my voiceover career, but health, health, health. If anybody's listening and trying to mimic this, don't, you don't need to let me do it. I did all the work. Um, you don't need to do it unless you want to. And if you do do it healthily. But did you have someone teach you how to do that? Or did you stumble upon it yourself? Both. First, I stumbled upon it just because I went into the audition blind. I was like, I don't know. I saw the movie. I don't know. How. Again, I, this is coming from me not knowing how to do an impression, but he's a monster. So let's see what right. happens. I did the voice. I paid for it completely because I was just didn't know how. Uh, and then once I was cast, I sort of had had this flashback of School of Rock where I hemorrhaged a vocal cord on stage. Uh, which is a real story. And I didn't finish the show and had to rehab my voice back to what it is now. Uh, it'll never be truly the same, but it's, I got a lot of my range back, but I thought of that because it's Beetlejuice. <laughs> it's like the worst possible thing you can do after an injury is to play this role. So oh I God. did, I had, I stumbled upon what I thought might feel okay. And then I used a vocal coach that I used in school of rock. His name is Derek Rosenblatt and I can't live without him. Um, he comes with me and will continue to come with me on every single show that I do, uh, even if it has no real uh, intricate, unique voice. Keeps me healthy. I used a vocal pathologist named Christine Estes, and I had an ENT. And I was in constant communication with them. And throughout the process of developing it, they were right there by my side, making sure I wasn't doing any long-term or short-term damage. And coming from School of Rock, literally hemorrhaging, bleeding my vocal cords, to Beetlejuice was this health journey that ended up being, I never missed a show due to vocal health ever, not one show. I never missed a show doing for any vocal health reasons, missed because I had a sinus infection maybe, but did never did damage to my voice, still haven't. I've done a ton of voiceover like this. And so I attribute it to like incredibly hard work that only seems like it is very off the cuff. And that's the truth. Right, wow, that's incredible. Um, okay. You know, there was another show on Broadway called Be More Chill that like the fans demanded it happen, right? Like oh, it was right. off Broadway and and yeah. Joe Iconis and 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 family had yes. so much love and passion behind it that, you know, a producer noticed that and was like, okay, I'm gonna bring this to Broadway and we'll see what happens. Beetlejuice had a, yeah, it, totally incredible. And I loved the show. And and Beetlejuice was like 
um, a, a, a new version of fandom. I mean, we've had sure. a lot of different versions of fandom, but sure. this like voracious, <laughs> like it could never get enough. Yeah. Um, yes. Balanced against other, you know, things that is, I'm, I'm not a producer of Beetlejuice, other issues that, and, and then a theater owner saying we need new tenants. Like there were many crazy things that happened that were very hard to understand for someone not inside it. How, mm -hmm. if you could give me like the elevator pitch, because sure. I don't want to get lost in the weeds of like the minutia of it, sure. but like, what can you describe what happened? Sure. Um, the sh lo very long and short of it is that when we first opened at the Winter Garden, we were not doing the sales that would uh, mean that you're going to be a hit or a long running show at all. So we were like losing a ton of money. So contractually, something took effect where the theater owners could start looking for new tenants. And it just was bad timing because by the time they potentially found a new tenant, you know, whenever that was going to be, we started becoming a hit. And we, that became out of TikTok and that became out of sort of like this new generation of fans that found the show in different ways. Um, and also it was a show that catered to people that weren't just musical theater people. Um, so we just started becoming this meteoric sort of thing. And then we got the nominations and then all that kind of stuff became a hit show, except the fact that contractually we had to close and, and potentially find a new theater. COVID happened. Um, so we, no one got the chance to go into the winter garden, uh, then music man. And then over COVID, they were desperately trying to find a new theater because all throughout the pandemic, the Beetlejuice fans never wavered. They were there the whole time I was doing Q and A's and classes left and right about the show. And so it never left sort of the zeitgeist of like what Broadway was. So they decided to bring it back and it was met with a ton of warmth and wonderfulness and the fans are voracious, but they are incredibly warm. I will say that go on the record and say some of the warmest fans ever um, and kindest. And again, lifelong. I mean, I just did spam a lot at the Kennedy center and there were people at the stage door in Beetlejuice cosplay at spam a lot. So they're big fans and it's very heartwarming. Um, uh, but that was it. I mean, that was, and now it's touring. And so the show kind of had this like, no pun intended, sort of resurrection, right? Right, right. And I'm thrilled for it. I hope that it continues. I would love to, you know, potentially come back to it if they do a yeah. West End production, maybe yeah. kind of try to do that or, yeah. Um, Cause I feel like every time you come back to something, even when I came back for the second time, Beetlejuice, there was like all these new ideas that totally. I was so thrilled to try out. So it could, yeah. you know, with time and, and I get older and more decrepit, I'm sure that my Beetlejuice will change. And, uh, but I how great that is a part you can never age out of how great. True. Yeah. And, and hopefully this is my big, you know, pitch out there for anybody listening that's doing the show is that don't just cast guys. Cause the whole idea of this was that Beetlejuice is a demon. So if you're suspending your disbelief enough to believe that that's a demon on stage, it's not a big leap that it would be played by a woman, a trans person, non, it really is truly built Yeah. with some minor rewrites because they'd have yes. to for certain things. Yes. To just to be, be a human. A to human, be anybody. A human being can yes. do this role. Yeah. I think the criteria should be you're a funny person who's willing to go there. That's it. Yeah. It doesn't matter kind of anything else. And so my hope yeah. is that the future kind of shows many forms of that. That character. would be awesome. My I dream. don't want to take you down like a dark road because I'm sure it was traumatizing, but the, how did you get a concussion doing <laughs> Beetlejuice? It's not that dark of a road. It's just was, you know, a bit of negligence and, uh, you know, a mistake, uh, not my mistake, but uh, I did this a 500 plus times the show and I get thrown through a door uh, that opens, two doors open automatically and I fly through them and they close. That was supposed to happen. What didn't happen was that they opened. So I didn't run into the doors because I had plenty of time to see it, but because they weren't opening, I have to exit the stage. So I took a left off stage right and hit a vertical cross beam that's there waiting for another set piece to go on. It's just not my normal route. So I thought I knew what was there, but just headed back and it was just the right amount of no light Oh, that yeah. I thought I was, I was trying to dodge a horizontal right, cross beam. But in fact, I tucked, the vertical, yeah, I sort of yeah. ducked into a vertical one, which slammed, you know, my mic into my head and uh, didn't know I had a concussion, uh, didn't see stars or anything. And Did then, you finish that show 
or was it obvious had, that yeah, you couldn't? No, we only had like five minutes left. And so adrenaline yeah. just pushed me through. I was remember being angry. I mean, I remember yeah. being really rocked by it and, and uh, confused. And then by the time the next, uh, by the next day, I started having like really vicious concussion symptoms for about not eight, nine days. Wow. And then we slowly but surely and, and tentatively found my way back to being able to do the last three evenings because I couldn't get there for the matinee. Right. Um, and we modified some things and all that, but it, it, it ended up being a very happy ending, thankfully, to be able to close it out. Um, yeah. The right yeah. way. So yeah, I was yeah, happy, yeah. but, and I don't have any lingering effects and I, I hold no real true bad blood and it's just mistakes happen. It, and, it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And the show could, the show could go on. That was the thing. The show could go on. I'm not a believer in the show must go on. I'm at right. all. I'm not a believer in that at all. I don't believe in it in any way. I, right. I just think if you need to stop, you need to stop. It's live theater. We're all humans, but the show could go on. So we finished it. It wasn't, I don't want to, I don't want this to be on the record as some heroic thing. I understand. We could yeah, just yeah, do yeah, it yeah. and we did it and we figured the life part out right afterwards. Right, right. I want to just kind of pivot to a minute because I said early on, you know, people listening to this podcast know I met Cynthia Nixon in 1988 doing, I mean, that's a long time ago. And we were doing a series together, one of the first for a new channel called HBO. Like that. I've heard of it. Yeah, that's. That's how we, we were, were on the prairie. Well. Yep. Yeah, we were, we were rubbing sticks together to make fire and trying to make a TV show on a, on a network called HBO to that <laughs> end. Um, Cynthia told me about a play called everything is fine that yes. she had been sent. She had started directing theater. Um, it was written by Alex Brightman. I thought that's funny. There's this incredible Tony nominated actor named Alex Brightman. They have the <laughs> same name. And she was like, no, it is in fact, the same. Alex Brightman. Um, <laughs> and she told me the 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 subject matter, which was really intense. Yeah. And, you know, I know you is like, it, it is not shocking that someone who is as hilarious as you are <laughs> um, also has a very deep, dark side to him or an ability yeah. to go deep and dark. That's completely in keeping with the greatest comic minds. Oh, um wow. But, you know, this is, this is, as I recall, about um, a family of, you know, you hear these horrific stories of a young person, um, you know, being a shooter in a horrible scenario, and yep. you think about the victims, um, and this highlights the family of, of the shooter, correct? Yeah, of the perpetrator, yeah, it does, yeah. mom, dad, Sorry, mom, dad, and, mom, dad, and brother, Um uh, younger brother of the of the perpetrator and and um it's just about a year or two whatever time has passed um we're actually funny enough just still kind of tinkering with how much time we believe the show has you know the events of it has been it's all still being right. developed and yeah but it's about and I, this whole show is about identity like we develop an identity over many years. What you're, who you're talking to right now is just this like big jumble of identity that I've tried to, you know, put together. And then overnight, something like a school shooting or a mass shooting can happen and change the identity of people forever, taking away everything that they had made before. And so this play, yes, it involves the events of, of, a, of a shooting, but we, it's not really talked about a lot in it. It's, it's a lot of like, the family of this person trying to move forward, move on. Is that possible to defy the identity that they were just given as that kid's family and attempt to sort of like regrasp their own singular identities as people? And is that ever possible? And I just got very interested in the idea of that just because it's a quirky corner. And that's really putting it lightly. It's a, it's a, it's a really shady corner that, a lot of people don't think about. I didn't until I did. And so I really wanted to write a play about identity and who we are and what we are after a certain thing. And can we ever get it back? Or do we just have to evolve with the times? And so that's the question I reckon with in the show. Um, and yeah, a lot of the stuff I write is very dark. A lot of the stuff I perform is very light. And so it's nice. It's very difficult because a play like this involves a lot of research and a lot of sensitivity. So like my Google history is such a bummer, um, you know, when it comes to this kind of stuff, but it's been very worth it. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, we're now in the steps. We've done a reading development, little workshop. It's gone very well, I'm very proud of it. And now I'm in the sort of like making sure all the 
I's are dotted. And so reading a lot, going to yeah. start maybe doing a couple of interviews um, with some people um, anecdotally just to really put some fine edges on it. And then I think we want to try and make it happen. We're trying to look for a, a theater that will kind of commit uh-huh. to developing it with us. Yeah. Just, yeah. And, and I'm okay with it taking its time just because I know the subject is is sensitive and I, I don't want it to feel like, nor did I ever want it to feel like some sort of like uh, taking advantage of a situation where, you know, again, unfortunately, like <laughs> it's not one of those situations that's going to get old, it seems. Exactly. And so, Exactly. That's really, really tough to reckon with is like, I, in, on the, the sort of the remarks in the beginning of the play, I, I have a little author's note that says, I, I hope that this play doesn't always feel current, but I fear that it right. might. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm having a, it's weird to say this. I'm having a very good time working on it. I don't know how right. else to put that. Well, the but, creative process has been really rewarding. I would imagine. It is. And also yeah. like you write a play, you no one tells you how many scenes need to be in it or what the scenes need to be about. And so once you, once I finished this thing and saw that actually the structure was like something that I think is good, it's very exciting to be in a place where like you have something that I think says something. And I'm, ex- I really, really want people to see it. And I really want people to experience it. The good, the bad, I'm willing to hear all things, right? Um, but right. I'm extremely proud of it. And Cynthia has been an incredible collaborator. And I don't say that lightly, all caps, incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she's definitely, I mean, she's one of the smartest humans that I know, and there's nothing more fun for a while. She and I would be like the matinee ladies. We would just go as many went, you know, it was us and, and people a little bit older than us generally in our, in, in our row. And there's nothing more incredible than talking about a play and deep diving into it with Cynthia afterwards, because her mind is just, I mean, dramaturgically and all the ways in which her mind works. Um, and she's got the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours of having seen or been in more plays than any other person I know. And she understands writing so deeply. I I have a question for you. This is so random, but I thought of it. Was there ever a time when you were researching this play that you are working on that you would Google something and you would be nervous that you were Googling it because of the subject matter in terms of someone seeing you or finding out or like the big (laughs) brother of it all, like seeing what you were asking about? I guess. I mean, I have answers to the questions is the thing. You know, it's like if if somebody- I use incognito. Right. Oh yeah, I mean, I think I yeah, I think that's a smart thing anyway. But I I certainly would have the right answers to the questions if somebody came to me and said, "You're a boy, you seem to be googling this awfully a lot. Are you, yeah. you know, whatever?" And so no, I mean, I'm not terrified of that. Yeah, you know, I'm terrified in general of the Big Brother of but everything. Not, yes, but yes. not necessarily that specific for thing. your play. Exactly, it's for my play. Like, and it is. I don't, and I don't get any sort of like added benefit of googling it. It's it's it takes bits and pieces out of me to read. To be honest, I'm sure. And, I can only uh, imagine. But it's at at the core of it is that I believe it is an entertaining play with, and the last reading we did proved to me that there is comedy in it. I mean, there's truly is funny things to be had. Darkness, so sometimes darkness is very funny. And so there are moments of that. Uh, but for the most part, is a, it is a pretty heavy uh, play. Yeah, it sounds like it, but it sounds incredible. Thanks. Um, you have so many things on your plate right now. A lot of projects. Is there something that we're going to get to see you as an actor in soon that you can tell us about? Depends on when this comes out. Well, this actually lives forever. So when we think about it, um, is what well, is the when, next thing you're excited about uh, as an actor? Well, again, I mean, I it's I don't. My question is, when are you putting this out? When are you putting this podcast out? Because it really I will depends. Keep it. Uh, until you say okay, that okay. we could we could put okay. it out based on news you're about to break. Okay, so I will be yes, very soon you will be able to see me as an actor on stage again because of again because of the writer strike. I was trying to kind of move towards writing, but now it's on hold. So I am going to be in a uh, play on Broadway at the Golden Theater this July called "The Shark Is Broken," um, and it is about the filming of Jaws. Uh, and it is about the three stars of Jaws, Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, and Richard Dreyfuss, uh, waiting on the orca, the boat, waiting for the big sharks to be fixed. And it's just a big 80 minute meditation with these three guys in a very small space, uh, battling egos and talking about 
you know, art versus commerce and, and what anything is about and why anybody does anything. Uh, and also you get to see like this really great feud between Robert Shaw and Richard Dreyfus, which was like very historically, you know, uh, known that they were at each other's throats, this entire insane process. So it is a, a three-hander. We're running, we'll be running till January 7th. I'll be playing Richard Dreyfus, um, a young Richard Dreyfus. And uh, I'm really excited about it because it's back to, we talked about it. Like my first thing I ever did was a play and then it's just been musicals until for 15 years. And so this is like exciting to be a part of this. I'm very excited for people to see it. And then I don't know, I, I'm hoping that spam a lot transfers because it's yeah, time and it's I would time, love, totally. and I would love to do it. I had such a good time at the Kennedy center that I would love to do it with that group of wackos. Yeah. So I've been very privileged and very blessed to be given this opportunity to do a play. I think I'm going to handle it with care. I've been memorizing on my vacation. You want to I talk about it. work ethic? That is how devoted he is, my friend. <laughs> That's right. This between is a all professional. My, yes. <laughs> between all my iced coffees and oysters out here in Montauk, I am memorizing lines. Uh, but yeah, I'm very excited. We start rehearsals at the end of this month. And I am beyond excited for people to come see it. Um, it's also just a cool play. Well... I mean, breaking news, my friends. I can already see the ticker. All right, before I let you go, Alex Brightman, is there a little known fact about you that you can share? I was thinking about this because I had heard, I, I, I've listened to you before. And so I, I've been trying to think of something I've never talked about. And I think a good one is an admission. And it's also uh, sort of a, a way forward is I have notoriously been not much of a reader. Um, oh, almost at all. It just kind of bored me and my mind would go away. And with the right medication that I've been on now, I've been re re-diagnosed. And so I have uh, manic bipolar, which I take meds for, which sort of cleared everything down and made me feel a lot better. I've been giving myself the time to start reading again. And so a little known fact about Alex Brightman is that he is a now a voracious reader and has read many books this year and is in the middle of reading one now, finished one already here. Um, and so a little known fact about me is I have just recently at the age of 36 found joy in reading. All right. That might be of all, I mean, those were two, as you said, two amazing in an admission and a fact. <laughs> Actually, they're both facts and admissions. That's true. Yeah. Um, so thank you for your candor. Sure. Thank you for this incredible conversation. And right I, back at you, by the way. I mean, you I really, truly wait. are such a good conversationalist. I could oh, talk to you for such you. a long time. Well, I'm not kidding. I feel like there's, I mean, you know, we'll figure it out, but it would be really fun to do that with you. And I've never... Um, I've never said that before to a guest, but thank Let's you. Do Let's do mostly um, mistakes. Mostly, mostly mistakes, everybody. Mistakes. Coming, coming yes. to the theater near you. Just the two of us. That's like 20 episodes before we even <laughs> have. <laughs> that's right. We even need a guest. That's right. No, we, we really don't could even go. Need a guest. We, we could, could go. go. Will there be an audience? Who knows? But well, I still talk to you as a matter. Who I don't cares? Care. Exactly. Have the greatest day. Good luck thank with you. those lines. What a sweet dog. Thank you, Alex Brightman. <laughs> Until next time. Bye-bye and thank you. Bye-bye.